So we're going to spend some time talking about craft. I um, recently was rereading uh, parts of uh, Boys on the Bus, a book that was referenced um, several times yesterday in comments by some of the presenters. And uh, for those of us who didn't know or, or don't remember, because it was a long time ago, um, that book uh, was written by Timothy Krauss um, based on reporting he did just three years out of college. Uh, he was um, uh, a new hire at Rolling Stone. Um, there was someone with a much bigger name who was out covering politics. And Mr. Krauss uh, volunteered to be kind of an aide de camp and went looking for stories that Hunter Thompson uh, would not be interested in, in writing about. Uh, and in doing so, he um, hit upon this um, very obvious but previously relatively unexplored um, reporting based on really reporting about the reporters. And in doing so, helped immortalize the term pack journalism. Um, and he showed this almost uh, preternaturally, uh, this preternatural ability to see old things with fresh eyes. Um, and so we heard several comments yesterday about the dangers of covering the last election, how not to make this cycle story the stories that were the last cycle, um, you know, failing to notice when a story has moved on. But another pitfall, it seems, is in failing to see the newsworthy in the commonplace and the familiar. So we wanted to, we were thinking about this, and we were also interested in finding some time to think about and talk about craft today. And uh, we started talking about this project that we do at the Neiman Foundation, which is um, Neiman Storyboard, which is edited by Louise Kiernan, who's with us this morning. And it's looking at really um, wonderful pieces of nonfiction um, narrative and trying to answer the question, why is this so good? And we do something called Tuesday Annotation, um, actually Annotation Tuesday with an exclamation point. And uh, we really, we, we pair a writer with a writer in, in sorting through why a story uh, works. And we've been wanting an opportunity to do this in a live way, and um, today seemed uh, like the day. And the story um, we hit upon um, is uh, Evan Osnos's wonderful profile of Mayor Richard M. Daly uh, that ran in The New Yorker a couple years ago um, called The Daily Show. So for some of you yesterday you said, are we going to be talking about Jon Stewart? The answer is no. <laughs> um, we're in Chicago. We're talking about D-A-L-E-Y. Uh, and um, I talked to Evan a little bit while he was um, actually working on this story. And one of the um, wonderful things about those conversations was about um, Evan giving himself permission to um, cast off old tropes um, and to step out of an old narrative about a very familiar story. Uh, and maybe it was, you know, living in and reporting for The New Yorker out of Beijing when he thought of this that helped. He was viewing it from a very different um, geographic perspective. But I also think it just showed a really um, active and disciplined uh, approach to reporting and writing. And it's a challenge that um, journalists never face um, more abundantly than in covering uh, campaigns, it seemed to us. Writing about um, Mayor Daley, who you know, was elected first in 1989, re-elected five times, serves longer than any other mayor, including um, his father, Richard uh, J. Daley. So um, there have been a lot written about him. And so what we want to explore today is how you take an old subject or a familiar subject and see it with, with fresh eyes. Uh, so um, we invited uh, Dawn Turner Trice to um, be Evan's interrogator to pose the questions, why does this work? Maybe even to ask if something does work uh, in the course of this story. And um, so that's who we have with us today. And I just want to say uh, on a personal note that um, when I was editor of the Chicago Tribune, uh, Don and Evan were among my two most favorite uh, colleagues and remain so. Don is um, a Neiman Fellow at Harvard this year 
and she will be returning soon to her post in Chicago where she is a columnist and a senior reporter at the Tribune. Uh, and Evan, who uh, has returned from Beijing and is now uh, thinking more about US politics than he has in a long time and maybe forever, writing for the New Yorker in the Washington Bureau. Please uh, join me in welcoming Evan and Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with Likewise, you. Likewise, yeah. Uh, I, before we start to talk about the story, I want to talk a little bit about how the China correspondent for the New Yorker magazine yeah. comes to write a lengthy profile about the Chicago mayor. Yeah, I'm hoping the finance side of the New Yorker is not listening to yes. this because uh, <laughs> they may have some of the same questions. Yeah, it, it, it was actually essential to the process that I was living on the opposite side of the world in a way because I got interested in Daly for two reasons. One, I worked at the Chicago Tribune for nine years and he loomed over us like <laughs> Zeus. I mean, this was a period <laughs> in which his impact on the political culture in the city was just so profound. Um, but I was a squirt at the Trib when I started and I was in no position to be able to interview Richard Daly. And in fact, I was junior enough at the Tribune when I was there that um, I was assigned to cover this total no-name candidate who was going nowhere uh, uh, named Barack, Barack Obama, Obama. who yeah. uh, <laughs> then proceeded to get beaten in his first congressional race. So you fast forward a number of years and Daly now comes over to China now and then. Mm -hmm. And when, he, when you see him in China, it's actually a, a, a more vulnerable moment for him. He's more kind of revealed to be who he is. He has none of the armament that he has here, uh, where people, where the, where the crowds part when he walks in. And so I got to see him. You actually could have some conversations with him there where he was a little bit less guarded. And, um, and if I'm being honest, then I think the reason why he said yes to this mm -hmm. is because uh, he said, the China correspondent wants to write about me. This is going to be a cakewalk. This will I'll make quick work of this <laughs> fellow. Right. And so I had to be alert to that, you know. That's a real danger actually when somebody says yes. But he also is willing to, um, t in order to be like a, a dictator, he's also willing to accept some of the downsides of authoritarianism to get some of the benefits. And you mm -hmm. were, were saying that that you, you remember hearing uh, people in China speak about officials there in the same way people in Chicago uh, were yeah. speaking about Daly. Yeah, the thing that fascinated me about Richard Daly was, look, he presided over a period in Chicago history in which the city on a whole variety of measures was improving. Yeah. Um, not for everybody, not equally, but the experience of living in Chicago was fundamentally different in 2010 than it was in 1989, you know? Right. Um, and I talk about it in the piece that it was a favorite activity for foreign, for foreign reporters, meaning from New York um, or um, from LA, to come in and sort of survey the situation from the hotel and declare yeah. it Beirut on the lake, right. which is how Wall right. Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal put it. And what they were really talking about was, was racial divisions. They were yes. talking about a, a place of profound, um, um, there was a sense that there was a deep problem in the, in the complexion of the city, in the, in the chemistry of the city, and how, they, how people were talking to each other. I want to get yeah. to Beirut on the lake, but talk talk about the the reporting process. Um, how much time did you get with Daily, and how did you get such access? To well, I came. I got um, over the course of about four months. Mm -hmm. I came and went, and I would come in. Sometimes I would see him, and sometimes I would not. Mm -hmm. um, and I, in advance, I, I said, "Look, we need to have an arrangement where I get to spend full days with him, where he's not." picking and choosing things that I can see. And they mostly honored that pledge. Um, every once in a while, after I'd gotten a few hours with him in the office, I'd be told that he had a meeting that I couldn't be there for. And that was, that was sort of OK, but not great. You know, you're, you're aware in that moment right. of the, the perils of manipulation and the <laughs> seductiveness of sort of, I'm here, and I'm getting an opportunity that other places haven't had. He hadn't really provided that sort of access in a while. Sure. Um, so over the course of those months, I probably had about four full days with him. And um, and then the key thing which was that a he, lot, we should which say, was, a, right? yeah, I mean, I mean it was more time. than I would, yeah. yeah, more than you would usually get. And <clears throat> the, 
the other thing was that he, the key fact from my perspective was he didn't tell people not to talk to me. Mm -hmm. That's what that Which would have great. been yeah. really a problem um, if and I started calling. We see this in around. the story. Um, I will not read the whole story <laughs> to you, but I do want to read the lead because I think it's um, I think it's 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 instructive. Before Barack Obama considered running for the U.S. Senate or the presidency, he wanted to be mayor of Chicago, a city so riven by race that the Wall Street Journal called it Beirut on the lake. Obama left for Harvard Law School, where he confided to friends his desire to occupy City Hall. But by the time he returned from Cambridge in 1991, something important had happened. Richard M. Daley had been elected mayor of Chicago. So this is a lead that you could start with this guy, Richard mm -hmm. Daley, who seemingly has so few political gifts. Um, how is he going to fulfill the promise of that name? Mm -hmm. But you start with Barack Obama. Tell us why. Well, initially, when I was working on the piece, you know how there's two kinds of leads. There's yeah. the kind of lead that comes to you while you're reporting and is yes. so clear, and it's this sort of searchlight that goes out over your reporting right. process and guides you the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other kind of lead where you tear your hair out and you know <laughs> you lose weight or gain weight, right. whatever the relevant <laughs> dynamic is. Um, and this was something in between. I was sure I had the right lead for the piece, mm -hmm. which, was, which was actually the second graph, which uh -huh. was basically that Daly was not born, and he would admit this if he was sitting on the stage, that um, he was not born with political gifts. Right. Uh, the English language was sometimes rumored not to be his first. Um, That's right. And yet he was also, in his own way, born into a priesthood. Yeah. And he was, you know, he had a kind of innate understanding of political dynamics. And I was trying to figure out how do you get these two elements in there. But the thing in the end that really was relevant at the time was in Chicago, in, in Illinois politics, there were three significant players around this period of time. Or if you, if you or maybe two years earlier, there'd been Rod Blagojevich, Barack Obama, and Richard Daley. Blagojevich went down, <laughs> Obama went up. up. And Way it up. wasn't clear what was yeah. happening with Daley. <laughs> And that was sort of became, for me at least, that was the operating framework. And I said, we've got to acknowledge that these two huge figures of our, one giant figure and one um, significant figure in Daly were, in, were coexisting in Chicago for a long time. And how did that work? And if we understood how that worked, we might understand more about Barack Obama. And we also, we have this introduction to race, which <clears throat> becomes a through line in the story. Right. Yeah. So I mean, so we have the seeds planted right there in that yeah. first graph. Yeah, that was uh, part of it. it was also yes. like race becomes the late motif of the thing because right. his father struggled with it and the son struggled with it and in very different ways. Absolutely. And I love this quote from um, the Northwestern professor where you you say that well he wrote that Daly had a tendency to misstate the obvious, invent words never imagined by linguistic researchers, introduce irrelevant material, and demonstrate anger at seemingly uneventful moments. Um, we get so much of Daly in the the, the next few paragraphs. Um, we know that his father also had a problem with syntax, um, <laughs> and that he's um, that Daly said he he no longer reads the, the local newspaper. Um, we we also hear that he's so concerned about beautifying the city that he he rides around with and, and jots down. Um, vacant lots on, mm -hmm. on a Manila, a Manila um, folder. And, and then this, this great description of Daly um, that and says- Can I interject something? Yes, yes, yes. Because I want to make my first admission of regret. OK. Um, which, as you know- <laughs> We want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, any, you know, any, r r anybody's writing a piece, there yeah. are those choices that you make about what you put in and what you take out. And one of the things I took out of this description, mm -hmm. where he's riding around the Manila folders on his lap, mm -hmm. and that's a a certain kind of stagecraft mm -hmm. that he's presenting to sure. me. Yep. And it's been, for people who are, if you're part of the sort of, if, if you're an armchair daily aficionado, which I would sort of consider myself one, that's a set piece that you've read in various mm -hmm. profiles over the year. He sort of made that available. And it's because he wants to demonstrate his alertness to small details. Right. But it's, it's a sincere thing. He mm -hmm. does care about these things. And he actually does do this process. But what I wish was that I had done a little bit more in that part of the story of acknowledging that he was performing one of his rituals right. or providing one of his rituals. There's little things you can do in the language that acknowledge um, that, you're that aware. I'm aware of the production yeah. of which I'm a part. And I think that serves the reader. Did you know at the time that it was a part of a production? And, you just, and so why did you leave it out? I left it out because it felt at that point 
I, I wasn't yet at the point where I wanted to frame his relationship really with the press. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It wasn't. It's one of the reasons I regret it. I was rereading and thinking. I wish I'd left it, and that was the right place to put yeah. it. And it would have signaled to the reader, okay, I'm with you. Yeah. Because this is you're at the point in the story at that point. You're building a trust. Mm -hmm. You're building a sense. The reader needs to know that this guy is alert to what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And um, I wish I'd done that. I've learned to do that yeah. a little bit better in Washington, where things where you're more aware. When the right. senator is cooking you dinner, mm -hmm. that's not because she just <laughs> right. thought you're a wonderful guy and wants to have you over for dinner. Theatrics. Yeah. And so and without being, you know, and you try to do it in a way that's not cynical, where you're saying, right. okay, this is just a pure uh, pageant. But you're saying, we are involved in, we're both doing our jobs here. And mm -hmm. what part of, of this person's job is to present an image of how they want to be seen and portrayed. Well, that kind of gets to my second question because I, I love this um, this description of Daly. He looks like a healthier version of his father, short, ruddy, and jowly, despite regular gym visits and a breakfast regimen of grimly nutritious shakes. And I wanted to know why. I mean, you have very uh, very specific details, and, and we're, we're starting. He be, he's becoming three dimensional. We're mm. starting to really see him, and we're seeing him if we we knew him. You know, if we know him, and and we've growing up knowing him. And if we're kind, if we're not. So I'm wondering why, how did you choose these details? I mean, in, there are two kinds of subjects, often the kind who exists in an in a abstract place where you, mm -hmm. you say, what did you eat for breakfast? And they say, the nature of breakfast is a reflection of the soul. And you're like, oh man, this is going <laughs> to be a long interview. And right. then there's the other person who is so involved in the details that they don't actually see the bigger picture. And um, Richard Daly was less comfortable talking about himself usually in in at, he was less he was less comfortable theorizing about himself and so but if you asked about really specific things like why do you ride a bike for instance that's his preferred exercise activity or why do you eat what you eat then you could you could start to assemble a portrait and it just happens that like New Yorker technology such as it is and the way that we write stories are that they are an assemblage of a million pieces of of errata, you know, like the, <laughs> the small things that may not be of um, any great interest to it. We, we, I was having an email exchange last night with an editor who was asking about a submission. Somebody had written a submission about um, the Chinese president's choice of wearing a windbreaker. Mm -hmm. And we were, she was trying to figure out, is this a story or is this completely trivial? Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a great story in there, the same way that if you had a member of the US government who wore the same jacket every day, that there'd probably be a piece there. Um, so anyway, I was interested in the breakfast partly because I wanted to understand um, what Daly thought about his own uh, longevity, mm -hmm. whether he thought of himself as being in this job for a long time. Uh, his father died abruptly. Yeah, um, a heart attack. Yeah. yeah, and his father runs through the story. Uh, his father's yes. kind of sitting on the shoulder of the piece the whole way through. Absolutely. Um, so we get back into a little bit more detail, more of the history in which um, we learn that Martin Luther King Jr. called uh, Chicago the Birmingham of the North. And, uh, and, and, and then you talk about just some of the, the, I mean, just how the city was prior to uh, the mayor taking office. Just some of the, the details were harrowing. And it's a place where you could have, you could have put a lot of numbers I know you had to look at the numbers mm. to get the narrative. So I'm wondering why you chose here, because later on you do have numbers that are, when we talk about um, the election and how you know you compare the, the numbers in terms of race, how many people voted for him early on and how many right. people or the percent who voted later. Um, but here, this is more of a narrative. You've got um, the center of the city was a desiccating museum of masterpieces by Mies van der Rohe and Louis, Louis Sullivan. And, and so why here, why the narrative? I wanted to capture uh, the lived experience of what it feels like to be in Chicago because mm -hmm. Um, one of the more striking changes over the years has been the sense of the vitality of downtown, of the loop, for instance. Yeah. And that's the, in many ways, that was one of the hardest parts of the story, and I think probably not a very successful part of the story, because what you're trying to do is encapsulate an entire city's evolution. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, you, we retreat into numbers, yeah. actually. Like, yeah. as a writer, that's where you take refuge, because mm -hmm. you can't argue with that. Exactly. You know, it's right there. But if you're trying to make claims about 
things that matter, that's a much more uh, arguable point. And it's worth acknowledging that you know, anytime somebody writes about Chicago from outside, it's a perilous venture. Because mm -hmm. this, as a culture, Chicago journalism, and I say this with sort of some luxury of having been an insider and now being an outsider, but when you're an insider, it is a great pleasure to be able to write, to look at the person who's come in from outside and say, God, they really made a hash out of right. that. They got that all wrong. They don't even know that that's a place, not a yeah. street. You know, yeah, that's exactly. an avenue. And, right. And so yeah. I was really concerned you look about. For those details. Yeah, oh my, it's, yeah. A, it's, you know, and then you write a sharply worded editor, right. a letter to the editor. So I was kind of, <laughs> kind of worried about that. Uh, but it, it, it applies too to subjective descriptions of a city and whether, in fact, it's whether the things that I'm choosing to describe there are um, faithful demonstrations of where the city is. And so that's a gamble. Another flaw or another challenge sometimes is that you get a lot of the according to, uh -huh. according to the US Census. Right. And you don't have that. We just mm -hmm. have to trust you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that you did the homework yeah. and you did the research and, and it's yeah. there. Yeah, that's part of the, you know, if you get it wrong and you get, and that's, if you lose the reader in the first 10 graphs, if you have something that they know to be untrue or that doesn't ring true, then, then you're in effect. Um, in, you go on to talk about um, you talk about Chicago and how well it's it's fared, um, and then we get to a point at which uh, I, I really I appreciate the transition. You use Grand Park to talk about the night, the present, mm -hmm. um, the night of um, Obama's win, uh, the, the, when the celebration in Grant Park, and to say that this was also the place where the father had sent in police officers to, you know, to. Let's say, okay, beat up is too strong, but <laughs> to go to on restore after, order. Yeah, restore order, <laughs> yeah, to civil rights workers yeah. and anti-war um, or, or protesters on both fronts. And so that's a nice. I mean, was that like an aha moment that you can because you are you're juggling, right? I mean, that's what a story is. You have mm -hmm. so much information, and how do you put in, you know, knowing when to add what, but and to take out to not use something. But there's this moment where you're able to seamlessly um, you you. Have have the past and the present a lot throughout the whole piece. And this is a great use of the park. As I, I yeah. almost felt like Grant Park was sort of the Rorschach test for uh -huh. Chicago because you viewed it, you know, Richard Jay looked at it as a moment in which, Richard Jay being the father, looked right. at it as a moment when um, he made the hard choices, you yeah. know, to, yeah. to finally uh, restore order at a moment when it was needed. And then in its own way, Millennium Park, which was Richard M's contribution to that part of the city, was also its own Rorschach test because people looked at it and you could look at it and make a credible case that this was a demonstration of waste, fraud, and abuse and corruption. Mm -hmm. And I sort of mentioned that in the paragraph. Or you could look at yeah. it and say, this was one of the boldest and arguably most successful additions to a major American city in a very long time. Right. And both of those things were true. And I, I, you have to figure out a way that those can go together. But they, there was a natural sort of physical, almost geographical mm -hmm. logic to, um, to putting the father and the son's legacy side by side. Yeah, yeah, and it's and and then and you also in the same area you also you're able to get the other people who are connect the people who are connected to Obama, mm -hmm. um, but who also have deep deep ties to uh, Daly, including his wife, including mm -hmm. Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. um, and and then this this the paragraph. Um, which I just I, I found fascinating. Uh, when Michael Bloomberg became mayor of New York in 2002, he made a point of moving his desk out into a bullpen shared by his staff in order to promote exchange. And then we find out that Daly's office is more like a bunker, mm -hmm. which I <laughs> which I love. Yeah. And and not only I mean so in his office there's this desk that his father used. But he really doesn't hang out in the office. Mm -hmm. He hangs out in the conference room. Yeah. Um, so what does that tell us about David? There were a couple things I thought that were interesting about that. He, um, one was there's a kind of seclusion that's essential to understanding daily. Yeah. Part of it is self-generated, and some of it is about this point in his career. The self-generated point is that he is, by nature, and it's going to be a surprise for a, a career politician, a very solitary figure in his own way. And, um, you know, I think it was Axe actually said at one point, yeah. he, he's a guy who can be in a room full of friends and stand in the corner. And that's 
not something that you see about Richard M. Daley when you see him on the news, is that he is, in his own way, um, alone. And yeah. you know, his sport, cycling, is a solitary act. Sure. And um, once that became clear, I, I started to understand some of the other choices that he made. So for instance, and the bunker element was um, also a point of, I mean, it can be read, and I think it should be read as, that may not be a healthy thing for the mayor of a big city, mm -hmm. to be uh, con uh, both convinced that he's right and then also wanting right. to be secluded. Right. Um, but you compare it to, to you comp compare him to, to Bloomberg, mm -hmm. and later on, I mean, we see that Bloomberg does call when mm -hmm. you're there, and I'm wondering if you would have talked to Bloomberg. Would you have interviewed him had he not called? I mean, so it's kind of, it's, the, yeah. it's a great to be in, face to face yeah. um, with someone during the interview because a lot of things happen. You have yeah, these serendipitous moments. Yeah. Um, so would you have spoken to Bloomberg? I might have. I might have tried. He probably uh -huh. wouldn't have said yes. But you sort of have a wedge at that point right. because you can say, well, I've got this side of the call, you know. And the other thing, the other reason why I thought the Bloomberg element would be important was that I wanted to show. There are two no more different biographies in some ways than than yeah. you know Bloomberg <laughs> and uh, Rich Daly, and yet. There's something about what it means to run a big city at this moment that they understood about each other. They had very different approaches. Um, but I thought that was important to capture. To, part of the interesting thing about, about Daly was the way that he was regarded by other big city mayors or other mayors anywhere. And I mentioned in the piece that he would go to these conferences and be treated sort of like a rock star. Mm -hmm. And this was particularly irritating oftentimes right. to the political class in Chicago who was looking at him and saying, but what about this, 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 yeah. this, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but you know, but he's big in Biloxi. And when right. he goes down there, he's a big hit. And I was trying to capture the two elements of his persona because sure. oftentimes we would hear, we would underplay the the fact that he was, in many ways, a model for people in mm -hmm. other cities. So I was trying to put those two things together. You mentioned the David Axelrod quote. Um, he could be in a room full of friends and stand in the corner uncomfortably, mm -hmm. um, which, which I thought was a great quote. But it also brought me to, I mean, not everybody gives those type, the same types of um, succinct, illuminating quotes. And you're also, you're conducting a lot of the interviews from Beijing. Yeah. So, um, so how do you get such depth from such great distances? Well, there, I don't, I mean, I, I, I got to tell you, it's, there are certain people who are uh, good at receiving an interview and are good at being interviewed. Um, mm -hmm. And that's part of the, is pick people who really know the guy and are able to describe him. But actually, what I thought was kind of interesting was, so there's, there's, oftentimes there's two ways that people approach long form narrative. You either want to go into your subject knowing as much as you can about that person, or you want to go in not knowing that much. And in my case, I like to go, so for instance, Scott Anderson, who writes for the New York Times Magazine, um, likes to show up in the place and then begin to learn. You know, he doesn't want to have half read all these books because then he feels like he's captive to the cliches and to, to the kind of thinking. I, I don't like that. I find I want to show up and actually know as much as I possibly can about this person because I want to begin an interview from the point of saying, what is the uh, universe of known information? And where can we try to push that a little bit forward? And um, in this case, you had a lot of people who had so, you know, a lot of people who had talked about Daly over the years in one form or another, and I was trying to avoid us lapsing into the familiar, mm -hmm. and this gets to the essential point, which Anne-Marie talked about at the beginning, which is how do you take somebody that Make is familiar? Fresh. And part of that is by gently nudging your interviewees out of what, you, what is a familiar register and mm -hmm. saying, but what about this other? Why does this person do this? Why did they make this choice? Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully. And, that, and so in doing the research, because you, you are trying to make it fresh, uh, and during the research prior to the interview or during, uh, how do you, what did you look at? I know that there were a couple, there's the, the biography by David Mendel. Yeah. Um, there is um, the, the, the book by American Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. uh, so how many books, how much did some of, because I know that some of it came from the, there was a large picture of Jesus on the living room wall and seven bronze baby shoes on mm -hmm. the mantel. Yeah. I that that's, and that I remember yeah. exactly where that, that came out of, Boss by Mike uh, Royko, which okay. is the urtext yeah. of Chicago <laughs> political profiles. And right. from my perspective, I, you, you, I had to read that stuff and digest it. I had a, this huge library of material that I accumulated for this story, uh, mm -hmm. partly because there's been a lot of great writing about Chicago politics. I mean, whether we're, uh, you, you know, you, and you have to, in a sense, um, you have to pay homage to that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, 
you're neglecting this body of not, it's not information, information's valuable, but it's, a, a, it's knowledge, which is something different, which is a sense of the city and a sense of how the pieces fit together. So I read all those books. The, um, at the time, of course, then Obama had written uh, his own uh, first book, and that was, he'd also written a second book by that point, but his first book was pretty helpful in understanding how he navigated Chicago politics, mm -hmm. because um, part of understanding daily was saying, how did he deal with this new factor? And the answer was that he didn't deal with Obama. Uh, he didn't embrace him immediately. It's sort of he had to figure him out for a while. Uh, but so anyway, I, you know, all of those books were relevant. And um, the you know the baby shoes on the mantelpiece that came out of Boss. Mm -hmm. And uh, but Elizabeth Taylor and Adam Cohen wrote the, an amazing book on the father called mm -hmm. American Pharaoh, which was. From my perspective, that was like the Oxford English Dictionary of modern yeah. Chicago politics. Mm -hmm. And then each one of these pieces fit together. And, you know. So in addition to the books, I mean, you're talking to lots of people. Um, a few of his, a few people who knew him from childhood, which mm -hmm. is interesting. How did you get to, to From his high school yearbook. Yeah. Uh, there was ah. the, the, the guy who was quoted in there was his class rep. This is Ron Gorluski? Yeah. And part of the interesting his thing. His class what? His class representative. Oh, OK. And uh -huh. part of the interesting thing was figuring out um, whether or not people would talk about him now. And mm -hmm. to a surprising degree, actually, there were some people from his high school class that would rather not be quoted on the record right. talking about him, which I guess is understandable, though you know the events had transpired approximately a half century earlier. And I thought maybe the <laughs> statute of limitations <laughs> literally and figuratively had expired. Um, but, uh, but that was helpful, part because for me, I was you, know, you can't write a New Yorker profile without doing a little armchair psychoanalysis. Right. And so I was really interested in his relationship with his father. And that was one of those areas that when you asked the mayor about his relationship with his father, it was a profoundly unproductive yeah. question. Because he would either go into a completely uh, like memorized, not memorized, that sounds insincere, mm -hmm. but he had, a, he had a theory of the case. And he, wasn't, he never really examined it when reciting it. Whereas what if you talk to people he went to school with and you ask, well, how did the teachers deal with him when he was a kid? Um, that helped you understand that he grew up with this strange combination of both privilege and then also this incredible responsibility and I think slightly terrifying responsibility for a young man, which is how am I going to fulfill the, the name that I've been given? You know, he, um, there's a point at which Daly, he talks about not passing the bar uh -huh. on the first time and maybe giving up, but then kind of knowing that he had it in him to pass uh, to pass it. And then this whole, I mean, he, he sounds a little vulnerable, mm -hmm. where he said, you know, they always said this about me, or the, the mayor's son's not that yeah. smart. And I'm wondering, was he really vulnerable, or was this another, a moment where he was just kind of, you know, doing his thing? To, I think that was actually him doing. shining through. I mean, yeah. one of the elements of his persona is this vulnerability. And, mm -hmm. um, the fact that he was always alert to the possibility of being um, of being underestimated, not only by his peers, but I love the expression that he used, the New Yorks and LAs and all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which seemed to encompass the rest of human civilization, the non-Chicago humans. And, and that was a big piece of how he sees the world. And so um, I wanted to try to capture that. And, there, you could, one of the reasons why it was great to get him on the road is that you saw him interacting with, uh, you know, the, with the rest of the world. I was in Beijing, I should say, about a year ago. Uh, I was walking down the street in Beijing and, uh, a year and a half ago, and I, and I said, I think that's Richard Daly. And, uh, <laughs> and he'd been out of office now for a few years. And I, I walked up and I said, and I, and I said, I said Mayor Daly. And, even before he saw who it was, he just brightened because <laughs> the idea that he was being addressed as mayor, and he sort of looked around to make sure that other people were hearing this too. <laughs> and then he kind of tried, and I, I, you know, that was that's essential to who he is. That is so Mayor Daly. Yes, um, there's a point. I mean, you, there's a lot of color in this um, in this piece, and being in Chicago, knowing Chicago politics, it's not hard to find color. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm wondering if I mean, how did you juggle? I mean, you talk a bit about Dorothy Tillman. And, and her hat and how mm -hmm. at one point he got the sergeant of arms in the council to try to force her to take it off mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and that doesn't work she, mm -hmm. she wins but then she becomes 
a person who is um, kind of a believer, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, this is a, a woman who was just staunchly, I mean, she was a huge Harold Washington, the first mayor, black mayor of Chicago, yeah. huge supporter of his. Um, but he's able to, to turn people yeah. around, um, some people. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yet, he still has, I mean, he's got this, this, this almost fatal flaw in that the machine is still the machine. The mm -hmm. machine, he has inherited the machine of his father. It's maybe a machine that runs on, as we said, fossil fuels now. Yeah, <laughs> maybe right. not the same old crackety right. thing, but right. it's still the machine. And so he, you've got the scandals that yeah. he has come up against. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I mean, did you feel like you were able to, um, so, with, so we have the color, but also the, the and yeah. how, I mean, his strengths, mm -hmm. but his weaknesses. Were you able to really um, get to the, the, the scandals that from my perspective, there were sort of a couple of big areas that he would not, that, that I thought were, were absolutely key to this piece that you have to write about. One was the fact that for a period when he was the, uh, uh, when he was the lead prosecutor in Cook County, that there was a police commander on the South Side who was torturing prisoners. Mm -hmm. And you have to get at that in a in a clear way, and it, it sort of occupies a section of the story, not because of his personal involvement, which is a part of it. And you, I sort of make a point of going through very specifically and saying he was sent a letter, and then he didn't act on the letter, and here's what right. his view of it, of it is. But partly because it's a reflection of you're sort of trying to explain the moment that he came out of and what he would have thought would have been possible and impossible to do. and. That legacy was created essentially by his father, and one of the meaning that the conditions that permitted somebody to torture prisoners essentially in a police station uh, right. um, over the course of several decades were the, was the legacy in the end of uh, of what was created by his father. And so, part of the and then so the other and then of course the big the other big scandal, though it's not news, this is sort of how do you put it into the story, is the persistence of corruption. Yes. And I was fascinated by corruption partly because um, there'd been so much great journalism on it in Chicago about how yeah. it was in the very creative ways that people would, yeah. um, would steal from the public treasury. And uh, there's a guy in there whose nickname was Quarters, and the reason he was nicknamed Quarters was because he'd stolen $4 million in quarters from the toll authority, right. which I said, I want to shake your hand. Down. You just want to step back yeah. and say, I, I, <laughs> I have to give you, you a, yeah. It's impressive, <laughs> sir. It's a, a, your creativity. And then, but the, the fact that Daly had not, had either chosen not to or had proved un, unwilling or un, incapable of ending that period, mm -hmm. Um, was essential to understanding who he was because there were people, really knowledgeable and credible voices in the political establishment, particularly in the political press in Chicago, who felt that this was a stain on his legacy that in the end would, would um, uh, I think, undermine, they thought it would undermine his. John Cass certainly would have yeah. written and had written a lot, and we talked about it in the course of this piece. Mm -hmm. um, that he felt that that was Daly's problem that he would never get out from under. And I was trying to situate that into this uh, a broader assessment of what his time was. It's interesting. But it, I should say, yeah. I, you know, I, I didn't break one solitary syllable of news on mm -hmm. the subject of corruption or on police abuse. And I knew that sort of going into it that probably this kind of story was not the kind of story where I was going to be able to do that. And I would, so I would sort of leave it in the voice of places like the Sun-Times who broke mm -hmm. the trucking scandal mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, it, it was interesting to see how he, I mean, w you talk a lot in the story about his father's legacy. And in this sentence, in all my conversations with Daly, he never criticized his father. And yet he has spent much of his career doing what his father could not or would not, would not, or could not do. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was really. Um, that's it's interesting because he, the the the, the son tears down public housing, mm -hmm. and he takes over the schools. Um, I mean, he does. He he gets the right. legislature to help him with that. But I mean, what? Did, why was that an important part of the story? Well, I think it's an important part of not just of the Daly family, but also looking out over the landscape of 2016. We are confronted mm -hmm. by figures who are for better or worse, struggling against the patrimony, the political patrimony mm -hmm. that they have um, gotten. And so if you're Jeb Bush, what does that mean? How are you going to talk about your father? And how are you not going to talk about your father and your right. brother? Because so that's part of the dynamic. Oftentimes, it's seeing how somebody's actions over the course of his career and Daly's career, he'd taken these steps 
systematically, really, to unwind many of the things that his father had done. Whether you, if you went down to the site of the old Robert Taylor homes, for instance, which had been, um, they were described by the federal government as a filing cabinet for the poor. And that was one of the things that his father created. And Daly removed them. But if you ever asked Daly, are you doing anything to undermine your father's legacy? Uh, that was, uh, you would get a response, uh, maybe not a printable response, mm -hmm. uh, but you would get a response. But it, in the end, it also wasn't, it, it really didn't tell you very much. Um, but you saw over the course of his career that he'd done all of these things to try to repair, I think, the right. damage in some ways that was left by his father. So toward the end of this piece, you circle back to Obama. And you talk about, I mean, the Obama finally, I mean, initially Obama didn't want a whole lot to do with him because of the unsavory things that mm -hmm. Daly, Daly's unsavory side. And then Obama, probably as, as the pragmatist, um, that they begin to create an, an alliance. And so this, this whole discussion, do you, do you feel like you kind of got to the, um, the connection, in, in this piece, the, the connection between Obama and Daley? No, I remember thinking you know, that, that I couldn't get an interview with the president for this story. Wisely, the president, I think, said no. Um, <laughs> um, and, but one of the things that came through was the fact that in the very beginning, what I was interested in was the change in the power dynamic. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, in the very beginning, Barack Obama was a nobody. And Richard Daley was the kingmaker. And Daley uh, avoided taking a position on the Obama candidacy. But when you talk to Daley about Obama, you actually got a sense that o Obama did. Uh, Daley figured, he said this guy made a mistake in his first race. One of my favorite details is that um, Obama didn't hear from Richard Daley over yeah. the course of the congressional run against Bobby Rush. But after he lost, yeah. on the next day, he received that. a telephone call right. uh, from Richard Daley, to, not to console him, but to explain right. uh, in a, systematically what, had, what he'd done wrong. And what I liked about <laughs> that was that he, was, he, was, he, he called him partly because he said, this guy has a future. He's going to be back. And I, and I think he deserves to have a future. And I think he's, got, um, he's a pretty good political athlete. But he also realized that he'd made some misjudgments. And this, one of the things that's fun about talking to, one of the things I enjoyed about talking to Richard Daly about politics is that it's a little bit like talking to um, a great, I almost said Yogi Berra about baseball, but that leaves the <laughs> wrong impression. What I mean is talking about somebody who is a total practitioner, yeah. who knows their craft completely, and can talk to, talk to, it about, talk to you about it in a way that is, uh, not at a remove, but he can look at somebody and tell you right away whether this person's got chops or not. Um, well, I, I want to talk for, I mean, to, to end this, mm. to talk about the ending. And I, it's, it's, it's really one that I felt like you kind of nailed it. It was interesting because it kind of came out of left field for me, but I thought it worked. For a moment, and he's talking to a group of students at Orr High School. It's a school that doesn't have the best test scores. Mm -hmm. um, and he's there, and it's Christmas. And, and, and this is the last paragraph. For a moment, Daly looks stumped. Well, he said, because a student had said, how do you become the guy? Mm -hmm. um, he said, well, my dad was mayor from 1955 to 1976. Then jaws dropped. The, the kids gasped. And for an instant, Mayor Daley savored the fact that nobody around him had ever heard of anyone else named Daley. Mm -hmm. Where did the ending come from? I was sitting in the room with those kids, and it was kind of um, amazing to notice that history, for their purposes, began in about 1988. Yeah. And um, so to discover that there had been another daily, what I imagine was, I like them trying to imagine whether the first daily ever felt self-conscious about having this bigger daily follow him. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was, from their perspective, there had never been world before daily, yeah. you know, BD, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> and that is, that's the, for him, I think for so many years, almost for a surprisingly long period of time, Richard Daly struggled against what it meant to be the son of. And, you would sort of say, how can this possibly be the case? He's been the mayor now for two decades. And <clears throat> but it was still, it was a position that he was trying to aspire to and trying to fulfill. And um, he always felt particularly judged by his father's legacy. And to discover that there was this safe place where he could go for that. And you know, he would among step kids. back out into, yeah, among yeah. kids. He was going <laughs> to step back out of that room and be once again yeah. in the maelstrom that he lived in. But for that little moment, 
uh, there was no history before him, and he was perfectly content with that arrangement. Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. That was fun. Thanks, Don. Thank I you. really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs>、yeah. I'm, asking Don、oh. to, I'm asking Don to put the photo up.、Um, that one. Because it actually,、uh, yeah, so that's a picture of、uh, the mayor at、um, Manny's Deli, a place my friend David knows well.、Uh, this is、um, a pretty awesome delicatessen on South Jefferson Street. And、um, it was a place where you could find、uh, the mayor or cops or a lot of journalists,、um, David and his. His pals.、Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joint. It's a hangout in <laughs> Chicago. And、um, just to,、uh, to complete the mood here,、um, we've ordered lunch from Manny's. <laughs> so、uh, we don't have time to take you there, but we brought Manny's、um, here to WBEZ. So、uh, sandwiches are around the corner. For those of you who don't mind the chill, you can obviously sit outside. There's a room over here or back that way. But before you do, Please、um, just join me one more time in thanking Evan and Don. Thank you.